worship this morning. Wasn't that just precious, precious, precious? I so appreciate uh, Tina and the team uh, and their passion uh, to lead us into the presence of God. Uh, we need that, don't we? Uh, and love is not just sung about, you know, your love came down, but the real essence of the love of God is when it's demonstrated in our lives for one another every day. Uh, and that's really what it means that his love came down. Uh, Paul said that the love of Christ is shed abroad in our hearts. And so you can't feel the love of God in your hearts and not want to extend it to somebody else. Do you all realize that you, as Christians, as believers, that we are the hands and the feet of Jesus in the earth? He's not walking the earth uh, anymore, uh, but we are. And he, he um, came into our lives uh, for the purpose of helping us to spread the love that he has for all mankind, no matter where they are and no, no matter what seasons uh, and whatever uh, things that they may walk through. Uh, so uh, I, I do want to let you know that uh, we're praying for, for uh, many, um, P Pastor Frank, Pastor Robin, we oftentimes get uh, reports of, of uh, throughout the week uh, through text and through people who uh, inform us of very uh, difficult things that are going on in people's lives. Uh, can I just reassure you uh, today that uh, no matter what the challenge is, even if we don't respond back to you personally, uh, if we learn about it, uh, and it, we want you to know that we're praying for you. Uh, we, we, really, we really, really are. And uh, I'll, I'll just tell you this, uh, the Lord is faithful to meet you uh, right at the point of, where you, of your struggle. Um, we have an assignment to pray, and I, I promise you, I can give you this assurance, this assurance that the Lord is um, burdening our hearts to pray for you. Uh, we wake up at all hours of the night, don't we, honey? <laughs> she can testify, I wake up at all hours of the night, and a lot of that time is, is interceding for um, the challenges that are going on in your life. Uh, so I just want you to know that we, we are, we're standing with you and believing God with you for whatever it is. And let me just say this to you, ain't nothing too bad that God can't deal with. Our prayers are not judgmental because we recognize that everybody's got struggles going on. And so uh, your struggles, your challenges, whatever they are, um, are safe with us uh, because we don't have the spirit of gossip on us. That's important. We have the spirit of intercession. We don't talk to people about your business. Just in case, I don't want to tell my pastor nothing because he's going to talk. That ain't me. Y'all, that's the other pastor, not me. <laughs> that may be some of you all's experience. Now, our, our heart is to just lift you up before God. Because truth of the matter is, talking about people's stuff ain't going to do nothing. But it's not going to help it. You know, the only thing that can really help is, is we, you know, go before God and ask him to help us. Because truth of the matter is, we pray in light of the fact we pray in light of the fact, um, like Paul said, that we ourselves have challenges too. So um, we're not unsympathetic to challenges in life. Um, Pastor Robin and I have challenges all the time uh, that are going on uh, in our lives, uh, uh, physically and uh, relationships and family, all that we got just like you, we're not exempt from it. Um, but we only know one thing to do is to, to go before God and try to do our very, 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 very best to just put another black eye in the devil's eye. I mean, just punch him in the eye. <laughs> so uh, uh, when, the, when the kingdom of God suffers violence, uh, one of the things that can happen is that you can get passive. You can go, well, you know, I just don't know what to do. Uh, and sometimes for me personally, uh, when you punch me too much, I, I, I no longer get passive. I start wanting to punch back. Anybody like that? After, after a while, you go, okay, now I had enough of this. <laughs> I'm tired of you messing with my this and messing with my that. I'm tired of all this. Okay? So it's time, it's time for us to see a victory. <laughs> you know, even if you don't know how to fight, just ball up your fists and just start swinging. <laughs> 
I remember years ago, boy, when I was growing up, and you know, you could tell when somebody didn't know how to fight. You know, schoolyard. <laughs> they just start doing this. <laughs> they, they didn't I mean whether they hit or they didn't know what they were going to hit, but they just start swinging. <laughs> and you're just praying that one of them will land and the thing will be over. Right? <laughs> Let me just say this to you. Even if you don't know what to pray, just start swinging. God, God will help you. <laughs> the Lord will help you. Uh, and, and trust me, even if you know how to fight, you still need God's help. You know, so he's for us and not against us. Uh, so we're praying for everybody who's under a heavy burden. We just want to encourage you to, to pray as well and believe God for a great breakthroughs. We hear a lot of um, challenging news, but listen, listen, beloved, we also hear good news too. Uh, so it's not all bad. There are victories that are being won, and we thank the Lord uh, every day. It's just a victory for some people just to get up in the morning, and we thank the Lord for that. Uh, how many, if you had, a, don't, don't raise your hand, but if you had a struggle getting up this morning and you're here, guess what? We celebrate the fact that you made it. I don't care what you look like. You still might have a little crust in your eyes, but bless God, you're in the house. We can fix the crust, but listen, only God can fix your soul. And it's okay. Uh, we ain't going to judge you for the crust if you don't judge me for my crust. Okay? <laughs> Come on, that's good news, right? Amen. Amen. You're welcome in the house of the Lord no matter what you look like and what you've been through, even if you've been through it last night. Even if you were messed up and, and, and just didn't feel like you could even make it the next minute. If you're here, God's got something for you. And we're celebrating with you. We're saying God's going to give you a victory. and He's going to honor your faith just for taking a step to get out and make the step in the right direction. He's going to honor that. And so that's good news. Every time you come to the house of God, there should be some good news somewhere. You know why? Because the gospel is good news. I'm preaching already. Y'all don't even recognize it. The gospel is good news. It's always good news. You know, so I, I reject the fact that we got to always talk about all of the problems in the world. We all know the problems. Turn on the regular news. But when you come into the house of God, you ought to be talking about, man, God's going to give you a victory. We're the only ones that can project Good news. The weatherman can only tell you what he think is going to happen. But we can declare in faith there's good news on the horizon. Why? Because hope springs eternal. The hope that we have in Christ always tells us to believe God for the great. Hallelujah. Joshua 1. Joshua 1, it's been a long day already <laughs> for me, but bless God, we're here. Joshua 1, verse 7 through 9 is our text today, and we are continuing our series in the book of Joshua as we're talking about position for transformation. And we're going to be studying out of the book of Joshua for the next several weeks. I believe there's so many encouraging and powerful things from the word of the Lord out of this particular book. And today, as we talk about being positioned for transformation, last week we talked about possess it. Today I'm going to talk about strong it. You say, that's not a word, I know. But it flows with my series because next week it's face it. And then after that it's fight it. And then after that, it's cross it. But today, it's strong it. <laughs> Hashtag strong it. And they say it's not a word. They say it is a word today. You'll see what I'm talking about. Verse 7, be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. And do not turn from it. Uh, to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. 
meditate, it day, meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Who wants to be prosperous and successful? Verse 9, have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. So Joshua ordered the officers of the people. And he said, go through the camp and tell the people. Go through the camp and tell them something. Go through the camp and declare something. Don't declare bad news. Declare, get ready, get your provisions ready. Three days from now, you will cross the Jordan here to go in and take possession of the land the Lord your God is giving you for your own. Get ready, somebody. Strong it. Don't just passively go into what God has for you. Go in with boldness. This is my land. This is my possession. This is what God has for me. And whatever God has for me, it's for me. You can't have it and you can't take it because it's mine. Every one of you sitting in this this room got something that God has, especially for you. And I promise you that whatever God has for you, it has something to do with a victory on your behalf. Anytime God has something for you, it's to improve your life. It's to better you in his purpose and will for your life. And so it's important to strong it. Sometimes you have to fight for it. Sometimes you have to to, uh, weather difficult seasons for it. And you have to battle for it. But if you be strong in the Lord and be very courageous, you will possess what God wants you to possess. Last week, we studied the first few verses of this particular chapter. And we said that the verse 2, I believe it started out by saying these words, Moses is dead. He says, Moses, my servant is dead. And he was telling Joshua this very important principle. Moses is dead, but you are not. Get up and get ready to move. Sometimes, in order for you to move forward, You got to let go of what was. And sometimes you have to let go of important things and things you cherish and things that worked in a season of your life that will not work for you in the season that you're going in. And the Lord requires you and I to let certain things go. And so we must not be afraid to make the transition to move forward in the new things that God is doing in our lives. And so, in order to possess some things, we got to let some things go. Look at somebody and say, let it go. The second thing we mentioned last week is that you have to be careful not to get stuck in the past. Sometimes the biggest obstacle to you and I possessing what God wants for your life is your ability to let go and not get stuck in a place that was good, but not what is God's best for this next season in your life. Sometimes it's important for you to realize that you can't make what God meant to be a stepping stone to be a tombstone where you camp out for the rest of your life. What is dead need to stay dead. What is buried need to stay buried. So many people move into a new season and they pine for the days of old and they start digging up stuff that God never meant for you to dig up. And said, I just wish I can get back what was. But let the dead bury the dead. Let the dead stay dead. Let stuff that God released from your life that was toxic and you didn't realize it was, that was bad for you and you didn't realize it was, that was not doing you any good and you didn't realize it was, to let it go. Stop talking about, I wish we could just go back to the old days. Listen, that's an indictment on the future that God has for your life. When you say, I wish we can go back, you're not looking at what God can do now. And God is always wanting to come on somebody to do something now in your life. He's a now God. 
Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. You need now faith, not yesterday's faith, yesterday's religion, yesterday's ideas. God's got a new thing that he wants to do in your life. And so we have to realize we can't get stuck in the past. And we have to also remember this, we mentioned this last week, that promise is good. Everybody loves a good promise. But let me tell you something, promise is good, but possession is better. You'll always have a promise, but listen, when God is ready to fulfill a promise in your life right now, go ahead and possess it. Stop holding on to a promise that God says is right here. You need to take hold of it. The problem with promise versus possession is that promise is always something that will happen that requires no real work other than just to believe. And trust me, believing is good work. But sometimes when you move into possession, it requires you to move to a new level of understanding and hard work that is required when you're in possession. The children of Israel lived in promise for 440 years, and all of a sudden, the manna was going to stop. All of a sudden, the quail coming out of the sky was no longer going to be in place. They had to work for their food. Sometimes we like for God to just supernaturally provide. And that's all right. God will supernaturally provide in a season. But sometimes when you move into possession, really all the time when you move into possession of what God has for you, he is going to require you to till the soil of the new season. He's going to require you to get your hands dirty. And the Promise me, prom I promise you that when you start working the land the way it's supposed to be worked, you are going to think, man, I wish I had those days when stuff was falling out of the sky. Because this is hard possession and moving into what God has for you will require you to get your hands dirty. It will require you to do things that you were not accustomed to. It will require you to get up early and go to bed late because you have to work what God has given you. Engagement is wonderful, but marriage is work. <laughs> dating is beautiful. You walk in a whole nother level of anointing when you're dating. Everything is wonderful. Doors are open. Food is paid for. Life is good. Romance is in your eyes. Sparkles are in your spirit. People look at you and say, you look different. You look happy. And as soon as you get married, they say, you look like you've been going through. What has changed? Well, I have entered in to the season of work. And you don't last 35 years off of Kool-Aid and romance, <laughs> off of a dream. You don't last 35 years talking about, I just love you so much. Sometimes you don't love so much. And when love wears out, work takes over. Commitment stands in a place. Come on, do I have a witness in the house? In Joshua chapter of 1, verse 7, he gives this admonition in verse 7 and verse 9. He said to Joshua and the crew, he said, be strong and courageous. Israel, they had gone through a whole season of setbacks and discouragements. And he was requiring them that even in the middle of all of the setbacks and discouragements that they had in those 40 years of being in the wilderness, that he was beckoning them and calling them and impressing upon them. I know you've been through a tough season. And I know you have been to the edge of promise before. But I need you to do something for me, Joshua. I need you to step one more time to the edge of promise, even after all of the disappointments. And this time, I don't need you to be afraid. I don't need you to wonder if I'm going to do it or not. 
This time, I know it feels like I'm pulling you along. You've been to the edge before, but this time, I need you to be strong. And I need you to press past all of the disappointment and discouragement of the past. Of all of the deaths that were happened in the wilderness. All of the people that did not make it. All of the people who disobeyed God. All of the people who just could not see. All the people who could not make the transition. You, Joshua, has seen it all. And this time, I want you to get to the edge. And I want you to be strong. It takes strength to push back discouragement that you've had for years and years and years. It takes strength to push back disappointments and challenges and, and struggling with your own faith of how you should trust God in this new season after you've had so many disappointments. It takes, it takes courage to get back up again when you've fallen so many times. And yet, knowing their history, because God knew their history, he still looks at Joshua well, with both courage to say, I want you to be strong. And we sort of like to recount to God what we've been through like he don't know. Well, Lord, but you know, when I've been here before, you don't understand, God. Really? Is that really a good thing to say to God that he don't understand? The reality is that we don't understand what's ahead, so we spend all our time talking about what was. And God is not so much looking at what was, he's looking at what will be. And he's trying to get you to see what will be. And the first barrier of ever getting to what will be is you got to push past your own discouragement. You got to push past your own whatevers and your own challenges and your own disappointments and your own failures and your own feeling of, of not having enough worth. I don't think I should go because, you know, last time, we always got a story about last time. Who don't have a story about last time in this room or online watching me right now? Every last one of us got a last time story. And some of us have memorialized last time, and we've journaled about last time, and we've cried about last time, and we've made, we've made stones about last time. Some of us can talk about last time from here to eternity. We can go back and in, in 75, this happened. And in 76, this happened. In 82, that happened. In 85, hey, listen, ain't nobody got time for that. And you certainly don't have time to rehearse in your own spirit what was. And your own, because you're bringing your own self down. So what you've been divorced? Get up. So what, you had a sickness, get up. So what, you went through bankruptcy, get up. And I'm not minimizing what you've been through. Thank God for what you've been through. But thank God you got breath in your body to get up. Thank God there's something on the inside of you that says, get up. What I love about God is that he always puts a get up spirit in every believer in the house. He always puts it in you. When you are at your worst, when people have counted you out, when you have counted yourself out, somehow, some way, some place, God, in his infinite wisdom, in his great counsel, will whisper in your spirit, you can get up again. You can make it again. Like, it's almost like you can't believe it. Are you really telling me this, God? This is what Joshua was probably thinking. Lord, are you really telling me this? Be strong and courageous. Are, you, are we here again? How in the world you got me here again? <laughs> Sometimes one act of obedience can get you to places that you never thought you would be. One act of obedience. Let me tell you something. Joshua had one act of obedience that caused him and one other person to get to this place. Caleb. They had one act of obedience years ago when the people of God crossed into this new season. They crossed into this land. 
Moses was in charge, and he sent 12 spies to the land, and he said, go and bring back a report and tell me what you see. Ten of them came back and go, oh, we ain't going to make it. We are like grasshoppers in their eyes. You don't understand. Even the grapes are pretty big. Even the grapes are bigger than us. And they, along with those, those 10, started spreading bad, listen, bad news spreads fast. Bad news throughout the camp. I want to turn your attention to Numbers 14. Beginning at verse 36, it says, So the men had sent to explore the land who returned and made the whole community grumble against him by spreading a bad report. Numbers 14, verse, 20, verse, 30, verse 36. So they, they grumble and they spread a bad report. That's what these 10 guys did. They went out and they just said, Oh, we can't make it. We can't make it. Oh, God, we are here to die. Listen, it was a self-fulfilling prophecy. And they grumbled. They spread, spread a bad report. Verse 37, these men who were responsible for spreading the bad report about the land were struck down and died of a plague before the Lord. But listen to this. One decision can take you 40 years later to a promise. Verse 38 says, but of the men who went to explore the land only Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, uh, the son of Judah, survived. One decision that says, I'm, I don't even know how this is going to happen. But Lord, if you say it's ours, I'm not going to talk bad about it. <laughs> if you say it belongs to me, I'm going to believe you. And it was that one decision that they made that caused Joshua to be at the de door doorsteps when everybody else couldn't make. Listen, your faith will take you places where your fear will never get you. Choose faith over fear. Sometimes we ride the bus of fear all our life. Uh, you know, we just let, we are like on the yellow bus, riding the bus of fear. And we get off and there's a stop. There's a stop faith. Uh, should I get off? I don't know. It just costs something to believe, because you know, you don't know. And fear is wrapped in disappointment and discouragement. It's wrapped up in all kinds of stuff. Get off the bus of fear and go, whatever the next stop of faith is, that's where I'm getting off at. Because that one decision can take you places where God, I mean, listen, I, one of my favorite passages in the Bible is this. It's in Luke, the fifth chapter. I won't read it. I'll just tell you the story. There's a guy named Peter. He's a professional fisherman. He knows his business. He understands what he's all about. And there's this man named Jesus who comes along on the scene and says, hey, Peter, what you doing? I'm fishing. Okay, good. Go ahead and cast out your net again. And Peter's response was epic because it's our response. He said, but you don't understand. Jesus, I catch fish for a living. This is what I do. Don't tell me how to do what I do. Jesus says, cast out your net. And, and Peter said, but I love that. He got off the bus of fear and said, oh, okay. But at your word, nevertheless, at your word, I'll do it. See, what you don't understand is that Peter was a catcher of fish, but Jesus was the creator of them. And I would rather listen to the creator than the catcher. Sometimes we're listening to catchers, people who think they know what they're talking about. And we don't listen to the creator enough, the one who actually creates everything that we're talking about. And he goes out, he says, nevertheless, at your word, I'll do it. That's what we have to do with discouragement, is we got to look at it and go, what's your word, God, say to me? If I can just follow your word, then I think I'll be all right. And it takes courage and strength Come on, somebody, to push back everything that's telling you not to. All the stuff that's, that has been embedded, sometimes things have been embedded in us for generations. Some, can I just say it this way? Some junk runs deep. 
And it carries with it not only the emotional tie, but it carries with it a spiritual stronghold. But God today wants to destroy all strongholds. <laughs> Casting them down. He wants to cast every stronghold down. It's important. Second Corinthians 10. Weapons of our warfare are not corner, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And he describes what strongholds are. Oftentimes, strongholds are not handcuffs, the physical handcuffs on your arms. They are imaginations and thoughts that exalt itself against the knowledge of God. The biggest stronghold in our lives is not somebody wrapping us up in a, in a, in a, in a, in a ropes or putting us in prison. The biggest stronghold, you can be walking around free as a bird and still be having strongholds in your head. He said they're imaginations. Listen, Paul calls them, some of them, vain imagination. Have you ever feared about something that you've gone to the worst part of what, I mean, it's like, what's the wor whatever the worst thing is about that situation, you there. You have, the, you have the anointing on your life <laughs> to go negative quick. <laughs> your child calls you, Mom, Dad, I need to talk. What's wrong? What happened? Who died? <laughs> Nobody. I just want to let you know I got this. Oh, okay. Well, good. Next time, just text me that. Don't be calling me. You're working my nerves. You know, daddy ain't lying. I mean, I ain't got it like I used to. Things just upset me faster. <laughs> Stop all that calling. Just tell me. I. In fact, if you want to call me, just start out. I got good news. Oh, okay. I need, I need things to be prefaced before they, you know, <laughs> protect your father's mind. <laughs> All right, sometimes we got to press past all that. The second thing is in this particular text, verse 8, he says, keep the book of the law always on your lips. Can I just say something to you? Now, no matter how spiritually sophisticated and anointed and prophetic you get, some things as a believer never change in terms of what you have to do. Some things never change. Here's number one. You're going to always have to have faith in God. That never changes. You never get too big and too anointed to have faith in God and not in your own anointing. The second thing that never changes is that God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. You're going to always have to pray. I, 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 I struggle sometimes with this generation that wants it quick and fast. Listen, some things you have to pray the price for. There's a price in the anointing in the spirit that requires you to get before God. And people will look at you and say, how did you get to where you at? So well, I can tell you, I can tell you. No, I just want, I just want, I just want the cliff note versions. Ain't no cliff note versions for 35 years of marriage. Ain't no cliff notes. It, it, it ain't like, well, you know, just do one, two, three, and that's it. And then you'll make it. Because junk pops up that you don't have a personal answer for that you don't know how to deal with, and you need to seek God for. There's always, you're going to always have to seek God. Number three, that'll never change. He finds, you always need to know how to wait on God. <laughs> Woo, y'all, I can preach that all by itself. If you don't learn how to wait, Isaiah 40, 31 says this, they that what? You know that word wait is translated in Hebrew trust? It's not just they that wait on the Lord. It, it, it's not like you're waiting for the number nine bus coming down. But it, 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 that's not the kind of way we're talking about. He's, those who actively trust God on a daily basis is what he's saying. He said it is the trust that gets you to the place where you renew your strength. And always, that'll never change. I don't know, anybody waiting on God for something right now? What it means is that you're trusting God through whatever you have to go through. Because when you're trusting, everything that you're believing God for will bring with it 
a variety of seasons and ups and downs and goods and bads and encouragement and discouragement that you have to deal with. And it is, so, so y'all see this, 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 y'all see that? Trust, even when it's like this, 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 trust ones like this. So if I'm down and I'm going up, I run through trust to deal with my up season. And I've, if I'm coming down and things are not looking like I want them to, guess what I'm running through? Trust. And I go down. And, 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 and things go back up, but guess what I'm going to run into again? Because I'm waiting on God. I'm running, I'm running into trust. Because sometimes we can get out of trust when things get high because we got it. It's good. We're on top. We're up by 24. We're going to win. It's the first quarter. We're going to win. This is it. We're going to the championship. But somebody on the other side going, I trust we can get out of this. Y'all with me? Y'all with me? Are we going to get out of this? Wake up. Let's get going. There's more game to play. Y'all knew I was going to preach it just a little bit. That's how our life is. Because you sometimes you're going to get down by 24. <laughs> the Bible says in Proverbs that a righteous man falls seven times. But when he rises... Oh, yeah, it looks it look, it look, it look like, look like you knocked me down. Some of the best fights I've seen is when the dude got knocked down in the first round, but he gathered himself and said, I'm going to trust my process. I'm going to trust my preparation. I'm going to trust what I prepared for. I didn't think I was going to get knocked down, but I trust that I got it within me to get out of this one more time. Trust runs eternal. So it's those who wait when you read that verse ever from this point on but they that wait up the Lord think about it they that trust God they that trust God that'll never change you find strength when you trust the fourth thing that will never change that you must battle through seasons of discouragement and there will be opposition I don't really have time to exegete this text but Jeremiah 12 5 says something very very powerful Jeremiah 12 5 talks about a season when Jeremiah was going through in his life, where he was really questioning God about what was happening. And God responded to him in such a powerful way. And it was almost like, huh? And if you don't really understand this text, it's just amazing to me as I was studying. Jesus, God says to Jeremiah, he said, hey, bro, you think things are tough now? And this is how he responded. If you have raced with men on foot and they have worn you out, how will you compete with horses? And if you stumble in safe country, how will you manage the thickets of, by the Jordan? Here's the issue. It's that sometimes we don't recognize that God is preparing us for another level in him. And if we don't realize that we, it requires a certain level of adaptation to run to the next season. See, you can't fight today's battle with yesterday's armor. Countries go to war. They got bombs now that we don't even know they got. But if you go, all right, we're going to fight this weapon in this war with bayonets, horses, <laughs> and we're going we're gonna to ride into the, we're going to ride into the other country. And we're going we're gonna to see a victory, all 300 of us. Y'all with me? Hey, Captain, uh, they got like this stuff that flies now. I mean, it's, it's like it flies. I think they call them planes. They call them fighter jets. And guess what? They can like bomb us from a distance and we never see the enemy. This is what Jeremiah, this is what the Lord said to Jeremiah. Can I just say something to you? We are, ooh, my Lord. We are in this, na in this country, in, in this season, we are entering to a season where a lot of Christians are still fighting with the wrong stuff. 
We we still arguing over who's sitting somewhere in the church. We still arguing over stupid little stuff that don't even make a hill of beans. Well, I mean, I just want to be recognized for the title that I had. Skip you and your title, because ain't, ain't nobody fighting with titles in the next season. But, I mean, I've been ordained a minister of the gospel for the last 400 years. Nobody care about I mean, look, and I just want to be recognized, and I need to be sitting on the front sheet of every church. It's the mentality of somebody who have raced with footmen, but they cannot race with horses. That's, that's where we are, y'all. But anyway, my point is, <laughs> my point is, the reality is that some things never change. And that you're going to always have to battle through various seasons. But you got to be ready. The, the fifth thing is, is that your faith will always be tried. It'll never, these things will never change. Your faith will always be tried. The sixth thing is and very, 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 very important is that God is God. God is sovereign. And guess what? When you say God is God, it means that God can do whatever he wants to do without consulting you. You can pray. Listen, we ought to pray, but your prayers will never, ever, ever, ever manipulate God. You know why I heard somebody say it this way? As he was eulogizing his mother, he said, God don't owe you nothing. <laughs> In fact, he already gave you everything. God doesn't owe, he doesn't, he doesn't owe us a decision that's always the way we want it to be. I've, what I've learned about God, God knows how to make decisions and get his glory in spite of our own way of thinking how it ought to be done. I have tried to command God a whole lot in my life. Somehow he don't listen like I want him to. And what's your problem, God? I mean, come on, really. This, I prayed exactly this way, and yet he'll answer in a way that I go, well, I didn't expect that. Okay, I guess you know, I guess you know what you're doing. <laughs> That's kind of the attitude we have. But God is always God. Here's the last thing is this, that you must trust the fact that, uh, or the last thing is this, that will never change. You must forget the past and move forward to what's before. You must forget the past and move forward to what's before. Isaiah 43, 18, 19 says, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. You all remember that, that rap song, whoop, there it is, whoop, there, that came straight from scripture. <laughs> that is right there. He said, verse 19, see, I'm doing a new thing, whoop, there it is. Y'all think all this stuff is original. These people are reading the Bible. <laughs> and they're going, how can I translate this to this generation? And somebody was reading, see, I'm doing a new thing. Oh, now it springs forth. Will you not proceed? I got it. I got the perfect, whoop, there, let's do that. Let's make that popular. People getting rich all the way. I wish some of you all would get some Holy Spirit inspired ideas. Y'all reading the word like that, and y'all got creative. Come on, create something. Make a billion dollars in tithe to the church. <laughs> and then your pastor would be like, whoop, there it is. Whoop, there it is. Whoop, there it is. Whoop, there it is. <laughs> I know it all. When whoop, there it is, I'm going to be doing that all day. I'll be like, yeah, whoop, there it is. You know that thing they be doing today. You know, all that, I'm all in. Yo, yo, I'm on TikTok now. <laughs> You're like, well, what's TikTok? It's a long story. You, uh, when you got an 11-year-old in the house, <laughs> you learn a lot. And she said, Daddy, I'm on TikTok. I said, you on TikTok? I'm on TikTok because I need to see what you're doing on TikTok. So what's TikTok, honey? Tell me what TikTok is. I don't know. <laughs> Let's sit down and go through this together. <laughs> it's funny. My TikTok account has one person I'm following. One. It's her. <laughs> and all her friends are following me. And I ain't got nothing out there. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know why y'all following me. I'm only here to follow her. <laughs> But I think I need to put something on there and just go, I'm following that good, you know. Well, my pastoral team going, no, pastor, come on, y'all, release me. 
y'all not gonna release me? Okay. I don't need to listen to y'all. I just need to listen to God. <laughs> All right, last thing. I'm done. Verse 9. And this is a doozy, y'all. The Lord said to Joshua, he says, I want you to remember this, that as you go through moving forward and what I've had for you. Verse 9, he says, do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. His last phrase, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. In verse 3, he says this to them. Same principle, same idea. He says, I will give you every place where you set your foot. I love this because this is the way the Lord said it to me this morning. As I was just meditating on this again. He said, tell the people, I'm told me to tell you this. That I'll be with you wherever you go. And I'll be with you whatever you go through. Wherever you go. And whatever you go through, I'll be with you. Sometimes places where you step your feet, they're not always good places to step your feet. And God says, that's still yours. You can imagine that when he got into the land, it still had a lot of places where they stepped their, put their foot in that needed a whole lot of, for example, Jericho needed to be conquered. It was theirs, but they had to fight for Jericho. Sometimes you can be right smack dab in the will of God and still have to fight. That's the problem is sometimes we say, I'm in the will of God. Why is this coming to me? That's exactly why it's coming to you. Why am I dealing with this? I'm in the will of God. I've always tried to do right, Lord. I prayed, I fasted. Yep, and all your prayer and fasting got you this. It ain't fair. No, that's right. It is fair because that's what you prayed for. You know, because you prayed that prayer. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. You know, remember that time you were praying and singing in church and you're like, Lord, just use me for your glory. Uh, God, I just want to be used for your glory. You rocked and prayed and cried, and God, just use me, God. You tarried and did everything else. You spoke and you did all of it and said, Lord, use me. He says, good. And he takes you to the promise that everywhere you step, your foot is yours. Yeah. Ouch. What's that doing there? Why? 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 Lord, I thought this was supposed to be my land. I put my foot in the land and stuff hurt down there. Yeah, I know. Deal with it. Okay, I'll just step somewhere else. Out. Okay, this ain't working, God. The Lord equips you for the next season. The next time you step, you got shovel and everything you need. Out. Okay, let's get something. Let's get this up. Smooth that out because <laughs> the Lord is preparing the land, not just for me, because somebody got to step where I was. So the next person that jumps, they won't feel the pain that I felt. They will feel sweat. They'll be encouraged to keep on going. They'll be, see, don't ever, ever hide your testimony what you going through don't ever let shame and all the stuff of what you think people are saying keep you from sharing who God and what God is doing in your life because your testimony is to set up for somebody else's deliverance everywhere you step your feet God says I'm going to give it to you my last verse, Psalm 60, 66, verse 8 through 12. Praise our God, all people. Let the sound of praise be heard. You would think he had something to rejoice about. Verse 8. Go back to verse. Praise our God, all people. Let the sound of praise be heard. Verse 9. He has 
preserved our lives and kept our feet from slipping. Why did you do that, God? Because they're recounting a story. Verse 10, he says, for you, Lord, when we got into the land, it wasn't easy. You tested us. We jumped in, and it was all kind of stuff we had to deal with. You tested us, and then you refined us like silver. Verse 11, you brought us into prisons sometimes. We just felt locked up. Like, I don't believe I'm in the land of God that he's promised for me, but I feel, still feel like I'm not making it. You can be right, let me say it again, you can be right in the will of God sometime and you feel like you got burdens on your back. And then he even makes it worse. Verse 12, he said, and then on top of that, you let people ride over our heads. You let people who saw us look at us and say, huh, I thought they were in the will of God. You let them be more prosperous and successful outside of the will of God than I am in the will of God. You let them ride over our heads. And we, we went through fire and water. But here's the good thing. But through all of that, you brought us out to a place of abundance. Listen, this jump and step of faith that feels like ouch now, just keep your eyes on the will of God. Because as you get victory over one area, it may not, next time it won't be just one shovel that's taking care of a situation. You've made room for somebody else to step in the land, and they got a shovel. And the both of y'all jump, and they've learned. And then two, two becomes four, four becomes six, six becomes eight, eight becomes 16, 16 becomes 32. I'm going to get really challenged in my math at this point, but you got the point. 32 becomes 64. How far can I go? 64 becomes 128. Okay, I'll stop. And before you know it, it's not just you who are walking in the place of abundance. It's you and your whole family and your whole household and a whole neighborhood and a whole church and a whole city and a whole nation. And we're pushing back darkness. If you can use anybody lord our testimony still is you can use us come come on up worship team i need y'all to help me i know we don't have a musician right now but come on we're gonna we're gonna press in without it we're gonna press in to what god has for us without it my message to you today is strong it y'all be strong and of good courage Stand up. I know you got oppositions in your life. I know you've been through hell and high water. I know you got junk that's going on in your spirit, in your household, in your life, but strong it. Deal with those giants. Face those demons. Deliverance is at hand. The power of the Lord is available to help us. They're going to come and just sing something. Talk.